good evening everyone uh, welcome i would like to welcome you all in this wonderful meeting uh, today which we have conducted by through uh, supply urology and uh, uh, today uh, our topic of the meeting is overactive bladder management and uh, latest guidelines and recommendations in overactive management of overactive bladder so uh, we are fortunate that uh, today i would like to uh, introduce our honorable speaker sir Uh, Dr. Ravi Basu Sir, uh, Senior Consultant Neurologist from Kolkata, as associated with Narayana Hospitals from Kolkata. So, uh, uh, I would like to first of all warm welcome our honourable speaker, Sir Dr. Ravi Basu Sir. Sir, thank you. Very well, welcome, Sir, uh, and uh, thank you very much for uh, giving your precious time and uh, uh, giving your time for uh, uh, this uh, wonderful session, Sir. Uh, from today and uh, without wasting any time uh, i would like to hand over this session to dr prabir basu sir sir from now uh, you will be the taking control of this session sir thank you very much sir thank you mr narayan for allowing me to talk on this platform and mm -hmm. uh, thank you sipla also for allowing me to come in front of the large audience so uh, today basically we're going to talk about on the just the guidelines we're not going to details it's just going to be a refresher sort of uh, evening evening refresher sort of thing on the management of overactive bladder you see i think uh, we as clinicians and urologists we get a lot of the patients not only we urologists get these patients also we general the general practitioners who are the backbone of our healthcare system they will be getting a lot of these patients okay and i find us a, a trend among general uh, practitioners and people who are working at the grassroots level in the rural sector they get a bit confused when they get a patient of an overactive bladder there's there's still some sort of confusion about patients who are having an urgency or urge incontinence versus vis a vis a stress incontinence right and even if the patients uh, we have do have patients elderly patients having full bladders huh? they are basically patients of chronic urinary retention they have been moving around for quite some time and they are having an overflow a dribbling always a dribbling they say that doctors are i was having always a dribbling and even i wet at the uh, bed time my the 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 bed clothes the clothes are they become wet at bed time that this the last time i wetted my clothes uh, uh, during night was when i was a child and now i'm wetting my my clothes now these things are very very typical of a person suffering from an overflow incontinence that is whenever you have a glass full of water and you just pour more water over it so what will happen there will be overflow of water isn't it a typical symptom happens so there are a lot of urinary incontinence so the simple fact of leaking urine can be due to many factors it can be an urgency incontinence where the detrusor muscle per se is very overactive that's the overactive detrusor we talk about and that's the biggest chunk of patients we have and that's where most of these medical treatment is focused on plus we have the stress urinary incontinence that is it's, it's this elderly females uh, the post menopausal females who after some period of time when they sit when they squat they feel that they're leaking urine when they 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 they, they blow the corn cells or the cough or the sneeze they leak the urine even on those patients you will have an element of overactive bladder that urgency or incontinence part so not only stress urinary incontinence so now the lifestyle modification part is based basically on the treatment of this stress urinary incontinence okay so stress urinary incontinence is basically treated by lifestyle modification pelvic muscle training urgency or incontinence mostly by the medical treatment and lifestyle modification but there is always an overlap between these two and then we have this overflow incontinence that is a person with obstruction then you have to relieve the obstruction there is no i mean they just beating on the bush giving them medical treatment mirabegron atolchinodine and uh, doing nothing and just is letting the patient go into renal failure so this is very important is that i just wanted to say this in the beginning of our presentation because whenever we are going to this presentation the presentation slides are meant to be uh, they are the very they are very i mean, I, I, i would like to say they are very comprehensive so when you get a presentation slide you will see that there is be chart like pattern stair stair like pattern what will be the first line of treatment what will be the second line of treatment 
but i think the basic thing we need to understand as a uh, as a basically a person who is not a urology specialist who is basically working as a clinician in a in, in a in a practice setup in a rural sector where we have this lot of patients coming up i think now i think uh, as a as a urologist going to clinics outside doing my in house clinics i feel the overactive bladder patients urgency urgent contest irritative bladder as the say they are forming a more important part of a patient client uh, patient uh, you can say the patient uh, uh, cohort cohort of patients is more than patients suffering from prostate problems per se patients suffering from suffering from stone disease patients suffering from uh, uh other symptoms like malignancy hematuria these are mostly these are this amount previously we urologists only came into play when we have these problems stone cases kidney stones uh, are, are prostatic problems patient gone catheters but nowadays we have these patients coming up in a huge number huge number so we have to stratify these patients whenever you're working as a clinician in a uh, in in a, in in a private sector or in a rural sector you have to triage the patients you have to see which patients you need to keep under your practice so and you get them get them cured with time and which patient we need to refer at the earliest or which patient requests surgery at the earliest so that is a very important distinction you need to make it in your mind while you see the patient and the purpose of today's discussion is just that though the, this is a this this is a um, latest guideline recommendation but until and unless you can understand which patient for me even for me see if i get a patient who has suffered a lot of overactive bladder symptoms and uh, he has taken all form of medicines he has taken even botulinum toxin injections then he comes to me so what is my role my role will be see i will tell you the next uh, the next obviously uh, the line of treatment will be a uh, pelvic nerve uh, that tibial nerve neurostimulation or the neurostrum devices you need to insert for that i'm not an expert person you go to that center so i'm basically referring a patient even though i'm a urologist i'm a specialist i'm a expert person i'm still referring to a patient to a higher center or suppose a patient has come and you see an ultrasound that his bladder is very much small small bladders thimble bladders 50 cc capacity bladders past history of tuberculosis these patients are very common now i'm not the person who is doing augmentation cystoplasis over and out up and every every month or two or three cases every month so for me doing an overactive surgery doing an augmentation cystoplasty will entail more complications the patient will have leaks the patient will have because the new form of bladder is formed or maybe he requires a new bladder so these we are not reconstructive urology i'm not very trained in it i'm not very doing these cases over and over again so i need to refer the patients to a higher center to an expert center where they are doing lot of reconstructive surgeries like this because these are not done on a routine basis that's why i want to say it's not that even if i'm a specialist even if i'm i'm a urologist i will not refer the patients to us where is my limitation where is i how to how what length will i he can treat can i treat him with a surgery can i treat him with a medicine what a second line medicines will you think of that's very important so you know your limitations treat the patients accordingly and refer the patient because these patients are already totally you can understand these are basically pissed off patients okay they have suffered a lot and they will go doctor shopping go to you go to the next doctor you will be practicing near your place and he will be very very un uncanny feeling about doctor the doctors don't listen to the to us they just write down a bunch of medicines that's not going to help us see the whole practice the vicious cycle will continue like this until and unless we triage patients according to guidelines that's where the guidelines come okay so sorry for the prolonged call, introduction that is the basically that this 5 10 minutes you have taken your time is the gist of what i'm going to say today right this is something else that the prevalence of the overactive bladder as you can understand it's big it's a big issue and it's a big issue in females now ask any female ask any female young female more than 20 years she will be invariably telling you that i had some episode of overactive bladder so common because previously people were not aware that's why they didn't give a complaint like this they felt that this is very normal to us now people are just getting aware and understanding that see a leaking of urine a sudden urgency the feeling of pain in the lower tummy that is relieved after passing of urination is a pathology that needs to be treated so it's a people who are getting aware and they are coming with the this thing so that's it very important and it, and there is that the age adjusted prevalence of urinary incontinence they increases with the age okay 
So that's what I want to talk about. You have to categorize the incontinence. You have to do the basic tests because most of the patients, in fact, in fact, I tell you one thing is I, I see these patients being treated right and left and up, I'm gonna, up and down, right and left with antibiotics. I don't know what is the reason for this. A person coming with dysuria, a person coming with overactivity of the bladder, somehow he or she gets a course of xanosine or gets a course of levofloxacin or what, I can't understand. Obviously they do well because there is some amount of the plastic effect also associated with it. Maybe they have an element of infection, but don't, I think this is becomes, that's, that's where it becomes until and unless the patient is in a very sick state and you have to start an antibiotic on empiric basis. Send a culture, start an antibiotic. Okay, then start an antibiotic and tell him or her to come back with a urine culture report after three to four days whenever it's available. Okay, so that is a very important thing. Just, just, just prescribing an antibiotic, listening to a person's urinary symptoms, the patient will tell you, I'm having UTI for, for the last 10 years, Dr. Sam. But that's not UTI. That's basically plain lower intact symptom. That's why the definitions are made by the international group, okay? Because lower intact tract symptoms can have irritative symptoms, can have obstructive symptoms. So the patient is having more of irritative bloods. That's a frequency or this is nocturnal we're going to talk about. That doesn't mean the patient is having infection. UTI is one component of LUS. It's not the all UTIs are, all UTI is present at LUS, but all LUS are not due to UTIs. So that's very important. Do a urine culture. That's very important. Do a urine culture. Nobody will tell you that you have done something wrong. If you have done a urine culture, a person coming to you with a urinary symptom, then if you feel if you feel justified, the patient needs some form of some form of uh, you can say um, good treatment. I mean, solid treatment from you that is in the form of antibiotics. Give start on an empiric basis and tell him to come back. But giving him days or days of multifer for ten days, twenty days without a urine culture obviously does not do any good to the patient and in fact does harm to the patient. Obviously, nitrofurantan doesn't have any much resistance previously. Now, because of community acute regular resistance, all these things are so all community acute resistance are all community acute. So the bugs are changing and this resistance is becoming very problematic. So you can find patients now, diabetic individuals having multi-drug resistance infection. Whom to give? You see the culture report? Only say cholestine is sensitive. Now, what will you jolly do with this patient? Then you have to admit him give him cholestine, see the creatinine levels, and all these things very, becomes very hectic, very problematic, okay? And the patient will say, oh my, you are billing me so much. Then all the problem comes. So, so then it's a post-virusital jejunal ultrasound. Obviously, uh, the, I think a female patient with a dysuria, you may not do an ultrasound in the first instance, okay? But a person, male patient with a urinary symptom, young male, sexually active male, I don't know, elderly gentlemen, it's always better to see an ultrasound. So first instance, even in the same guidelines, first instance of an UTI in a female, you may skip a USG. The patient any any other uh, complicating factors like a hematuria, okay, or excessive leaks, then you have to do an ultrasound, okay. But the clinical examination, urine routine culture is fair enough. Now the most important thing is that what we normally skip in our practice is doing a bladder diary. Now, this is again because most of our patient population, obviously, this is very much pertinent in the West where the 100% literacy rates are there. So if you ask a person, if you're seeing in a government setup in a, in a, in a, this thing, in a rural center and tell the patient that you need to maintain a diary, then this old farmer fellow will tell you what is a diary. He doesn't know what is a diary, liver and avoiding diary. So this is, this is obviously is a subjective matter. You have to, Case by case, we have to take all these cases. But it's very important the patient is literate enough. If he's able to understand, if he has a caregiver who is literate enough, then tell him or her that you have to see what is the amount of urine he's voiding. That's again the cumbersome method. Write it down and again, note the number of leaks. Note the number of leaks in between the 24 hour period. Also detect the intake. So it becomes more of a comprehensive problem. So it's not possible to even, even if you ask me, that Dr. Basu, you have to check in intake output for the last three days. How much do you think it's it, it's feasible for any person like me? I am educated. I am I am the doctor. I mean, I know everything else. But again, I will tell you, it's very difficult for me to maintain an intake because whenever I go to the toilet, it's not possible to carry a urine jar with a container with a markings in it. 
difficult to manage in practice, but all these recalcitrant refractory cases, the, the, what is the problem now? If before you do an a urodynamic study, can be solved by this voiding diary. So keep this in your mind, nothing more than that, okay? So this is the management of overactive bladder. The obviously behavioral therapies comes first. Now, as I said, overactive bladder is a death to serve overactivity. It's basically a urodynamic diagnosis. So urgency and urge incontinence as defined in the ICS criteria, that is a certain irrepressible uh, feeling to pass you in which you cannot control. And if it is it leaks, becomes urgency incontinence. This is basically a urodynamic diagnosis. It's not a clinical diagnosis. So you have to, if you want to diagnose, you have to diagnose it urodynamically. There you will see that the, there is a spike in, even if the, what is urodynamic? Urodynamic is you just like the patient, just infuse some water or some fluid at a particular rate, and you have some pressure manometer attached within the bladder, okay? So all within the catheters, within the put in the bladder. So basically we'll see that there is a sudden spike of the detrusor contractile pressure during normal filling. So for normal, what is normal filling? We are taking urine, we are taking water and the urine is produced by the kidneys and they come into the bladder. They keep the form some time, then we would go and relieve. So normally if the 50 ml of uh, urine is always there in our bladder, we don't need to go to the toilet to pee. Okay, so it will happen only when there's a sudden spike in the dead to so overactivity. This can be due to many causes. Now, there are some nerve centers which are associated, some pain nerve centers, like C type of nerves, capsaicin sensitive nerves, some A delta fibers, the fast twist fibers of the dead to some muscles being supplied from it. These are different issues. Somatic nerves, but this is not the today's topic. This is a pharmacological topic. Okay. So, what is meant is that the this urgency or urge incontinence where most of our treatment is dedicated. All these pharma industries, Euro pharma industry, as you can understand, urology pharma industries is basically put on two pillars. One is the prostate medicines, the other is the overactive bladder medicines. What do we have? We have 20, 50 pharma companies just vying with these medicines. So you can understand what is the, what is the magnitude of the problem. So many patients, so much is the problem, so much is the, uh, the, the burden of the health on the health infrastructure is that we are still unable to control with so many of the medicines we have in our armenitarium. So if you see we have anti muscarinics okay, anti what does anti muscarinics do? Is because we have your M3 receptor overactivity, M the muscle receptors are present in the blood, they get overactive by this A, A, A delta fibers or C fibers uh, overfiring. We need to give some anti muscarinics, that is, the some agents which we take by the oral medicine, go to our blood, go to that particular center, and block the receptors. So, there has been through the decades, through the ages, we have a lot of anti muscarinics. Okay. So, some they pass through the blood brain barrier, they cause some problems, some they do not pass the blood kidney, depending on the quaternary ammonium ion, that is a different issue. But uh, basically, Basically, what? So basically, we have this one medicine, and the other is the what whatever we are talking actually is basically the purpose of this of this today's presentation is we want to talk on Mira background. What is Mira background? Mira background is doesn't act on anti muscarinic because muscarinic receptors are also present in our eyes, are also present in our gut, are also present in our whatever in the sweat glands. So the problem with anti muscarinics is whenever we take these anti muscarinics, we have a dry eyes, dry mouth it's very very difficult so it's like always you are taking breaths to the orally you will have a mouth which is totally dry totally dry and even if you see if you go to a funeral function and you try to just to cry you can't cry so it's such a pissing out about it man a problem you are having xerostomia all this uh, you don't have a proper secretion of saliva and then comes the constipation these are emotional issues I can understand, but a bothering the most bothering problem is constipation. So these are things that all gets the, all the secretions, like all secretion gets in, in, in speciated. So the, the thing is the same, the, the bowel gets obstructed. So some there was some uh, change, there was some work being done in the pharma industry, and they found that there's another receptor, which is a beta receptor, beta 3 receptor, and which in fact, if you have uh, increase the activity of the beta 3 receptors there are it is also a, it is also a basically a system by which you can modulate the 
the the the detrusor contractions from being happening from being generating what really happens is that there is a one spark within one detrusor muscle and the, all the sparks comes together and they form a detrusor overactivity one spike so it is saying the level if you just give this beta 3 agonists then there is less chance of this micro sparks to happen okay so these are different different way of controlling the treat controlling the problem and the purpose is if you give mina background you don't have so much of complications so so much of complications like a dry mouth dry throat and dry eyes and with a with your dry constipation will not happen so most of these patients they they fail to continue with the treatment because they are not compliant enough they're not compliant enough it's not that it's not that patients are less compliant because of the medicines cost they are they are not so much costly but the complications are problematic mira background does offer some uh, respite in this fact is that they have minimal complex the only complex i have heard is patients who are hypertensive now requiring more than two or more than three medicines of hyper that two on a long term so uh, poor control of hypertension is one of the things that i have seen with uh, uh, with uh, mila beck otherwise bradycardia all these issues are never been reported at, at least in my practice okay now the first thing is is the behavioral therapy what did i tell you the most important thing is most of these patients will have a will have two things in together we have a overactive bladder and overactive bladder just gives the behavioral treatment like avoid constipation go for weight loss do some physical exercises keep yourself active mode do some pelvic muscle training like a kegel exercise and if it so if we don't dilly dally on this uh, uh, on this, this these behavioral therapies a lot in in a person with urgency incontinence but we go to straight to this medicines that's what we have talked about we start with anti muscarinic fails we go and to another medicine which is on a mira background fails then we give a combination of an anti muscarinic mira background fails then we stop it anti muscarinic continue with mira background again that's how it is done okay the third line management everything fails obviously we don't have much things to do here as i say you can give a interdetrusor injection of botulinum toxin very expensive and you can give it it's it's it can be done in the just admit the patient and give it on us it has a sub separate cystoscopic attachments and the drug is costly the drug is cause the problem with the detrusor is that this interdetrusor is botulinum toxin is that patients believe because they have paid a lot of money for this getting this injection they feel that they will be having no problem from now on the problem is these patients have a recurrence of symptoms and when they go recur then you have to give you have no other options you have to give the you need to give it to sir injection then it becomes oh, what the fuss you are talking about doctor you could have told me before you have charged me so many thousand rupees bucks <coughs> given this injection now that you need to take it again so it becomes much of a problem so even if you could get to the injections are not the end of the game so ultimately you need to give them on regular basis and i don't think our our uh, this thing our um, uh, healthcare uh, this thing uh, all this um, um, what this it is just hold on uh, this insurance companies they they do pay for the two injections okay because they feel that botulinum toxin is meant for only cosmetic surgery so botulinum toxin even any form of botulinum toxin is not maintained managed under insurance things so they have to pay out of pocket that's a problem so ultimately if they fails then you have to go for neuromodulation neuromodulation is a big man it's a big game basically put in some interstim device first stage second stage basically what i tell him i'm not the person to do interstim if they fail with this medical treatment you have to refer it to heart center okay because ultimately these patients these patients will require some form of surgeries and these surgeries obviously needs augmented cystoplasmosis new bladders i tell you if it even sounds very fancy these are fraught with lot of complications expert centers fine they do a good follow up they do a lot of cases for that i just just tell them go over there and do their surgeries so the most important thing in in uh, in an urgency in con is how you deal with the second line treatment and the most important thing that's the conservative treatment <laughs> we talked about okay this is the pelvic muscle flow training this pelvic muscle training we you know normal i think everybody knows and uh, that's the pharmacotherapy you're going to talk about okay so duloxetine i think duloxetine the prob it's more for stress urinary incontinence so uh whenever you talk about stress urinary incontinence then we will be having uh let me tell you there was a question on stress urinary incontinence uh 
okay so if it is something on stress unit incontinence also so patient with stress unit incontinence will be found to have uh, very obese patients so you have to ask them to so in stress unit incontinence that's what i want to tell you is the purpose is we have to go to lifestyle modification because these patients don't have too much of uh, playing around with your medicines which we have been an urge urge incontinence or big incontinence with predominantly predominantly urge incontinence the problem is most especially will have a combination of both so you need to play around with the medicines i said start with one combine with some other continue with some days after fails then switch off to one continue with the other then increase the treatment dose Now, 80% of these patients do well with this medical treatment 80% 80 to 90% i can tell you from my actually this is this is can say level 4 evidence from my practice clinical scenario how many people if you are practicing urology for quite some time then how many of you have seen the patients you needing intestinal devices or needing augmentation cystoplasty is very rare so it is not justified also to treat training for augmentation cystoplasty for this amount of years you get one patient in one year to treat okay so that's it so you are not doing it. so send to some expert centers to let them handle the cases rest cases you manage yourself so smoking cessation all these things containment pads uh, that's very important the most important is pelvic muscle training in intensive form in a patient the first line treatment in patient with stress urinary incontinence now even stress urinary incontinence they can be taken from the history can be taken from a normal physical examination you can also do a extensive urodynamic study but history and physical exam easily easily gives you the diagnosis which can be the predominant part of this incontinence in this patient but remember to say is that a uh, radical prostatectomy patients under the patient under the radical prostatectomy where they have a sphincter weakness even um, all this qrp large prostate uh, low laser surgeries whole hip surgeries this is a sim- different they, they, they need um, more more uh, extensive this thing pelvic muscle training before you give some respite like giving him a artificial artificial uh, sphincter or something like that okay so what did i mean the first these patients must be given the choice of a pelvic muscle training pelvic muscle flow training is of two types we are discussed in some in some uh, uh, concert, in some uh, this thing you know, in a like a meeting like this prior but we'll take about a one hour to describe what are the two types of uh, invasive uh, the intensive pelvic muscle flow training one is dedicated for this uh, you know, for the urgency urge incontinence which is nothing which is just playing with your mind actually just thing playing with your mind to stop the contraction something like that but the other is the normal kegel exercises which we need to do to relax our bladder and also increase increase the outlet resistance outlet resistance so basically to uh, take the uh, take up the uh, the normal uh, the the contractile apparatus contractile function of the sphincter the urinary sphincter because in males we have two sphincters the internal sphincter and the external rhabdo sphincter internal sphincter often goes off after a surgery so we are left together with the rhabdo sphincter which often gets weak with the age so we need to contract and increase the strength the power of this of the sphincter so the muscle gets relaxed it to some muscle gets relaxed and the rhabdo sphincter gets more strong so these are the way you control so this is the same thing duloxetine may help duloxetine this ssri inhibitors may help in some patients with the uh, uh, suis but again they are they are not very much active in the long term therapy most of these patients post menopausal they have a, a less estrogenized uh, mucosa uh, vaginal mucosa as well as uh, this uh, the mucosa and the, uh, the urethelium so these are more rigid tubes so you need to need to treat them with uh, estrogen therapy may sometimes have been early period but they are not long term big things okay so so occasionally some people have used desmopressin but again that that's a drug of very controversial conjectures now so ultimately we have this lower urinary tract symptoms as i said it's a big big uh, issue today because uh, because most of our we clinicians urologists depend on the medical treatment we are giving we are basically dealing with these patients the whole of the pharma industry is depending on this so that's a huge burden on our health infrastructure that we need to get the treatment so that's it so which patients i have talked about this will be a different ball different scenario altogether which persons need 
conservative therapy, which person is Ayurvedic medicine, all these possible effects, which persons lead uh, this, uh, this pharmacotherapy. It's a part of the Ayurvedic medicine, the ceremony. I'm not saying Ayurvedic medicines are bad. They're also very good. In fact, uh, in fact, we have uh, extracts from bamboos, bamboo, all this being happening. Also, we have extracts from ceremonial repens that they're doing very well. They're very good, they're very active in the prostina. No? You heard of this medicine, prostina being taken over the counter. They do very well. But which patients they need to be given is very important. That is totally your way that this is a person coming with an IPS score. My IPS score is depending upon irritative and voiding LUTs. Okay, you have to give a score pattern. Early symptoms, less bothersome. Then you can give all this medical treatment, all this uh, uh, lifestyle modifications, and also control of testosterone, control of the because these patients have a, what is known as a metabolic syndrome. They have they have high stress levels, they have high cholesterol levels, they have low testosterone levels, they have COPDs, they are very obese, they have a bull neck, they have obstructive sleep apnea, CO, all these things, cardiac issues, chronic issues. You take care of the whole thing by your conservative lifestyle modification. Then you give some uh, pharmacotherapies like this, say plant extracts and all this you can give. It. But later on, most of these bothersome symptoms will need some form of uh, medical treatment or the other. And the medical treatment will depend on two aspects. One is irritative. How much is irritative loss? How much is obstructive loss? Obstructing loss will need uh, some, uh, some medicine like uh, psilocin. Psilocin is a new bang on the thing, new drug because we haven't got a better uh, alpha blocker after psilocin for the last 10 years. Okay, we had tamsulosin, we had alpha psilocin, we had tetrazosin, a lot of things. But after psilocin, we didn't have a single, single alpha blocker after that. Okay, now uh, after that, then then that is one way of treatment. Then you can add a dutasteroid, the 5 alpha reductase inhibitors, if, depending upon what is the weight of the thing and it is dependent on the MTOPS trial. There are a lot of trials being seen that patients with a large process are more likely to develop acute retention, more likely to develop surgery. So you can give them a, the benefit of having a dual therapy. Okay, then that is for the obstructive symptom. Then you have an irritative symptom. The irritative symptoms are the same game. You give him a uh, media background, beta 3 agonist along with it. You can try with this uh, combination for long. Okay, so then obviously then you have to give a surgical treatment of patients are not doing well. So that's that's what has been saying on this on this slides. Okay, so when will you go for a surgical treatment? When will you say that no, this patient does not need any medical treatment at all on a follow up? Give him under normal monitoring. Which patients you say no, no more medicines to for your uh, uh, benefit. You need to go for surgery. These are the few uh, things you need to talk about. So obviously we have all. <laughs> Excuse me, all form of treatment, uh, surgical treatment in our gamut. I think we have patients, I think I have, I have seen patients coming to me uh, asking for a, a Eurolift procedure. I'm, 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 I was very, uh, I mean, I was, freaked, I was just freaked out when somebody asked me, why don't you give a Eurolift procedure to this patient? He's a young, he's an elderly patient and he does not fit for surgery. And I mean to say that, they're fine, Eurolift is a new procedure. It's been done in the West, but I'm not very acquainted to it. So, People are also understanding there are a lot of procedures, not only whole lab, not only laser surgery, not only normal TURPs or open surgeries, whatever. We have a lot of deposit angioembolization, uh, rotor ablation. These are the new treatments which are coming up. And just being, you can't say that these are only for textbook teaching. The people are trying to understand now, Eurolift is done in Delhi. Why don't you doing the Eurolift procedure in my elderly grandfather like this? So that's it. And again, a three-day bladder diary, the initial evaluation. And uh, don't carry out neurodynamics in the per se, but patients with a neurologic symptoms like patients on a Parkinsonism, patients having a neurologic problem, a spinal cord disorder, it's basically to, to do a neurodynamic before you think about any form of surgery in these patients. So that's it. I think uh, lifestyle modify, we have talked about this. So we will try to skip all the slides. The same thing, same thing. The pharmacology treatment, start the conservative treatment, depending on how many, how much you need to play on with conservative treatment, depending on your diagnosis. That's why I extensively told you what is the diagnosis will be look like. And then you try the pharmacologic treatment. What are the medicines you have? How much you need to give a space to your patient to play around? Start with one, combine with the other. Then, then whenever it doesn't happen, okay. So mirror background is the game changer. The purpose of today's discussion is mirror background. So start him on mirror background. Continue for 25. Start him, I, I give a 50. I don't think 25 helps. 50 does well, then tap on to 25. Doesn't help. Start with the tall or any other solifenacin along with it. 
Okay, so Mirabeg and all these new drugs like Vizibita S as the Cipla has launched. Okay, you start start with the Vizibita 50 first, doesn't happen, give a single uh, Vizibita S, solifinous is added to it. Okay, so this person does very well. Then it downstays that again to normal 50 milligram, 25, taper it down and then go off. Tell them they can always recur, then come back to me, I will always treat, but don't think this is a failure of treatment, that, that can recur. That's a very important thing. And these Botox products are very fancy things. So obviously surgical treatment is uh, is always there, but the purpose is to keep them within the medical thing because after the medical thing, once you go to surgical treatment, then the whole medical treatment goes off. Then the complications, surgery fails and all these young patients, what to do, all the complications happen. So that's it, it's a worldwide problem. The better way to deal it is the easier okay so in the chat window we have what is the drug of choice of female patient origin incontinence obviously mirabegron for me it's always mirabegron mirabegron has changed changed the way we are treating disease over active bladders today very less complication very good patient compliance cost factor also very affordable medicine and if the patient can carry on for at least for two years Patient can carry over two years. Then after some time, they, she may have some problem. Then you can add on, just put an add on, as you say, the, with the solifenacin with it. Uh, where we can prescribe the combination. That's what it means. Combination therapy is when a single drug fails in the long term. In that case, before committing to all this third generation medical, third generation treatment like intestines and detrusor injections or botulinum toxin, which I believe must be kept in the back burner of our individual practice. If you are only, uh, say, if you are a person who only specializes giving botulinum injections, there are people who just specialize only, I just give botulinum injections only. Come to me, I will give botulinum injections. Then only for you, go for botulinum. Otherwise, keep them in the back burner. Try all this uh, treatment with the combination therapy. Stop the combination therapy after the patient even doesn't do well. Then if you stop one drug, we will continue with the mirror background. Again, it will see that the patient is again responding. It happens. It happens like because these are two, both both receptors being at, 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 attacked by different uh, means. Okay. That's it. So that's it. I think if you have no more questions, then we will call it a day. That's already nine o'clock, isn't it? Sir, I think, uh, thank you very much. Sir. That is a very wonderful uh, discussion. So there, sir. And apart from this, uh, Thank you very much for sharing your immense knowledge in this uh, chapter, sir. Uh, right now, we do have only two questions, sir. That's all. So sir. we are done with two the questions. questions, sir. We are done, sir. So, so done. first of all, sir, thank you very much. Please continue support. And apart from this, uh, we will be doing uh, this type of uh, uh, informative sessions in future also, sir, in other uh, other therapeutic backgrounds. So uh, basically, sir, we have done one in uh, BPH and as well as right now we have done in overactive bladder. In further, we are also doing uh, another uh, things also, sir, uh, in the span of time. Thank you very much for sharing our uh, valuable time, sir. Uh, have a good day, sir. Thank, thank you, you sir. thank you. Bye-bye.